Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. On this week's episode, we talk Pteranodon, or is that Pterodon? Dave had an issue with his microphone this week, which meant we had to use the backup recording, so his quality isn't great. However, the quality of the episode is awesome, especially if you like Sharknado. So apologies, and please do enjoy the episode. Hello, and welcome to Terrible Lizards. We are still continuing our Flappy Flap extraordaganza. No, extraordinary. What's We're the word? We're off to a flying thinking? start on this episode. Okay. Well, we should be off to a flying start. We're talking about pterosaurs. So. I realised as I said it that it was quite a good pun, but it was thoroughly unintentional. Very good. So we've, we've done quite a lot already. Now, I might have been simple because I thought. Oh, we've done Pteranodon because we've done Pterodactylus and they must be the same thing because they're no, very similar. No, 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 oh, no yeah. very. Yeah, they've both got Pterro <laughs> in them because they're both pterosaurs. So yeah, ter- Pteranodon, so O absent, Don tooth, terra, terra wing, so the toothless wing, the flying animal that has no teeth. Though, and I don't want to devolve into this, Jurassic Park 3 put teeth in the Pteranodon. Someone went to the trouble of putting teeth in an animal that doesn't have teeth. As well. And is named for not having teeth. And is named for not having teeth. Though, though, though um, Jurassic World Dimorphodon, two type of tooth <laughs> animal, has only one type of teeth in the jaw. So, well, maybe yeah. you can see the other one because they would they just cycled through them or something. Yeah, no, 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 names appear to be largely irrelevant to the uh, makers of that franchise. But anyway, let's talk about Pteranodon, uh, which is, I mean, we've mentioned it in the past, definitely. Must have done, because it's one of those ones that I confuse with Pterodactylus, so... It's a really, really cool animal. And like a lot of the things that we talked about on the various series, it's an animal where we know an awful lot. So Ramphorhynchus, which I think we did one episode on last season, that's, you know, that's the only other kind of comparable pterosaur where we have a large amount of specimens and data and we've done a lot of work on it. So really, if you want to know about pterosaurs, Ramphorhynchus on the one hand and Pteranodon on the other are, are like the two kind of model organisms for this, but it's then preserved in an incredibly different way. So with Ramphorhynchus, we've, we've got, you know, 150-ish specimens, almost all of complete, well, most are complete or fairly complete. It's a very complete ones, exceptional soft tissue preservation, wing membranes, bloody, 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 bloody. <laughs> and a few, you know, a few in 3D and some nice 3D skulls with, you know, like brain endocasts and stuff like that, all of this stuff. Pteranodon, at least 1,100 specimens in collection. Whoa, whoa. Um, And that that number dates back to That's like bigger than a flock. Yeah, that number dates back to like 2001, I think. So Chris Bennett's um, big, big monograph on on Pteranodon. And that number has therefore almost certainly massively, massively grown since. However, almost all of them are A, flat in a way that Solnhoff and flat Ramphorhynchus, much flatter than that. And then on top of that, hilariously incomplete. So when I'm talking about, you know, 11, 1,000 specimens of, of Pteranodon, what I really mean is 950 bits and then 50 of them where you've got a few bones together. Right. And that is honestly the case for the vast majority of it. So almost every museum everywhere now has a really nice mounted, like 3D flying pteranodon hanging off the ceiling. I've seen that in so many places. It's all the same model taken everywhere. And loads and loads of them have that lovely flat one with its head turned to one side. The Natural History Museum has one. There's one in Yale. I think there's one in the Amon H. That's all over the place as well. They're all complete composites, usually made of like a dozen different specimens to put together. We we know a huge amount about it, but it you know one giant pteranodon midden almost. Pteranodon's monster. Yeah, it is. We we've, we've pulled together hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bits. And from that, we've got a very good idea of what it looked like, because, again, we've got the wing finger of one and then part of the wing finger and the forelimb of another and then part of the forelimb and the shoulder of another and then both shoulders and the back of another and then the neck and the back of another and then the neck of a head of another. So we can scale everything very, very accurately. And again, lots and lots of things that have specimens like that. 
But to my knowledge, there is like one fairly good all of a pteranodon in a block. And that right. one hasn't been described yet. <laughs> of course. Of course. Because it's, it's a fairly because it's a fairly new discovery. Okay. Um, and sitting in a sitting in a museum where no one works on pterosaurs. I'm hopefully involved in doing a description of it. Though to be honest, mm. there's not a lot to say because we really know the anatomy of pteranodon very well. To my mind, it is a bit like um being given a load of Lego pieces without the picture on the box this is the, what you guys have managed to do is recreate the well Im- more more a bunch of smashed sets so you've got big chunks there's lots mm. of little bits yes but you've got fairly big chunks that then between them overlap enough that you know, all right if i break a couple of bits of this and then it would fit very nicely into that one because they're yeah, all basically okay. the same yeah, you can put it back together. And I, actually, I want to mention at this point, so Chris Bennett, who I'm pretty sure we've mentioned before. You and Chris. I mean, honestly, people are going to want to know the backstory. And oh, the whole... just because just he's just an absolutely fantastic researcher. He puts out very few papers, very few and far between, but they are normally extraordinarily detailed. And his anatomical knowledge is just absolutely superlative. So he did his PhD thesis on pteranodon. So almost all of the pteranodon material comes from Kansas. Okay. So this ancient in, inland sea in the kind of inverted commas middle Cretaceous. So of course, we don't have a formal middle Cretaceous. Sparkly shoe slippers, witches, <laughs> yeah. and tornadoes, yeah. and little black dogs. That, that, you know, the, the ancient in, inland sea and mostly found what was the equivalent of like 100 plus miles off the then coastline. So they're properly out to sea. You know, these are real marine animals. Um, and yeah, Chris did his PhD where he looked at, I think, every known specimen. And then his thesis is very detailed. And then he turned it into an even more detailed two part monograph, just like the osteology of pteranodon and then like the ecology and behavior of pteranodon, where he lists and describes every single one of them <laughs> and then reconstructs pretty much every bone in multiple views, despite the fact that they're almost all crushed flat. When you've seen 70 humeri all crushed in different orientations and you're as good as he is, you can put them all back together and work out exactly what the bone should like properly in every view. And that's what he did. And so that's why Pteranodon is the basis of like most pterosaur research. That's why you love him. (laughs) But but yeah, because we don't have that for Mm. almost anything else. And in fact, there's huge numbers of fossil groups for which we, we don't have this. So to have it for a pterosaur... And as one as horribly crushed and broken and separate as Pteranodon is incredibly important. Talk to me about timings, though. So this sea in Kansas, I mean, what, what, when are we looking? What sort of time period? So off the top of my head, it's early late Cretaceous, which, of course, means that people go, oh, late Cretaceous. And so you've got all those classic and in fact still get, oh, here's T-Rex. And then in the background, there's a Pteranodon. And it's like, yeah, that's like 40, 50 million years out. And they're marine, so what the hell's it doing in the middle of Could Montana? They've been blown off course. Yes, a long, long way. Yeah, I can, ne- I can never remember the dates of these things, and then I forget to look them up before we record. Um, but yeah, it's it's fairly derived in the grand scheme of things. You know, it's, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's early, late Cretaceous. Yeah, just loads and loads and loads of them. And then, yeah, when I say crushed flat, there's, there's a lovely wing at the Natural History Museum uh, here in London. <laughs> Is, I'm, I realise I'm holding my fingers up to the camera, which will not yeah. work well on the podcast, like three or four mil thick for bones that are 50 centimetres long. It's like steamroller flat, flat. And, and as a result, of course, crushed, you know, very hollow bones, as you know, we've talked about many, many times, you know, so once you compress them, they just like shatter in situ. And it, and it really is less like, you know, flattening... a a drink straw so you you know the the overall shape of it is going to be about right it's not actually going to exaggerate it in lots of ways but it's just shattered yeah i was i was thinking you could really i mean you probably could i bet chris could but he'd managed to be Mm -hmm. able to tell you if they were sort of spherical or or obliate or where they're you know where they were because like our bones they're not all perfectly round yeah so so they're mostly fairly elliptical pterosaur wing bones we haven't really talked about that i don't think no we have um so a, a kind of um you know when you squeeze a toilet roll yeah so, you know a slightly flattened um circle um in cross section and that's because 
circles are incredibly strong in cross-section. We've talked about this, so like resistance to bending. This is one of the reasons you can make them very, very thin and very, very light indeed. Uh, so that helps enormously. Uh, but they tend to be, you know, pretty flat and squared off and solid at the ends because obviously that gives you some strength and there's a lot of stresses and forces going through those kinds of bits. I'm, I'm always um, put because because of my you know good engineering background. You see, Dave, With I'm soil. always I always think of uh, of uh, Formula One wishbones, the things that keep the wheel attached to um, the car, and how those are made of carbon fiber, which is incredibly brittle but incredibly strong and very very thin because they've got to make the cars as light as possible. Yeah. and you've got you know these hollow rods, which you know, and they are different shapes depending on their task and where they're sitting in the wind so you can see how evolutionarily these birds have birds no not birds they're not the pterosaurs have uh, have adapted uh, their wing shape yeah and there's an odd phenomenon about um cylindrical cross sections which i don't understand the mechanics of it but basically the bigger a cylinder is the thinner the actual material can be for the same strength. So this yeah. is why we often talk about pterosaurs. They don't as, and this is also true of birds and theropods and other things, they don't as such actually have really light bones. It's more what they've done is that they've inflated them because then for the same amount of material, you could make a small, thick cylinder or a big, thin cylinder, and they would have the same strength. And so by kind of blowing them up, you can get a relatively large bone for not that much more material than you could for a solid one, a fraction of its size. Does it's that really sort of explain weird. why they are so big? Because they don't have the sort of background of having these massively big, heavy legs at the back like birds do. And so it makes more you know, sense in terms of um, engineering and energy preservation to be larger because... Well, it's Does more that about it's, no. It's more because it's more about the musculature, and you you basically mm. don't need giant fat heavy legs just to take off, which birds do. Yeah. Birds, are, birds are stupid and rubbish and built wrong. They're dinosaurs, but bird, but you know, but birds have something similar in that the you know these enlarged but very very thin bones. But that's a general thing, and we want to talk about Tyrannodon specifically. No, specifically, specifically Tyrannodon, because okay, so they they we all the things we know so far. I don't know how big they are. I yeah. know that they're um, C, so I know kind of the shape of their wings. They'll be long and thin. Yeah, I know they, they don't have any teeth. Yeah, so presumably they have sort of a beak. Uh, and I know that there's probably going to be a lot of them drowning. <laughs> yeah. So, so what does Pteranodon look like? So you said pterodactylus, so they're both pterodactyloids, and as such, they have this big head, relatively big neck, though actually Pteranodon's neck is fairly short for a pterodactyloid, but big head, big neck, small body, long wing metacarpal, small fifth toe, and short tail. And then immediately we start getting some weirdness. So yeah, Pteranodon's neck is actually fairly short in the grand scheme of things. For a pterodactyloid, it's not that big at all. It also has a very long tail. The second longest tail, I think, of any pterodactyloid. And more than that, it's got a few little bones at the start and then kind of a whole bunch of rods that stick out. So its Ooh. tail is something like about two thirds of the length of its hind limb. Now it's got fairly short legs, but still for a pterodactyloid, that's a massive tail. That's going to stick out. Would that get in the way of when it landed and walked about and stuff? Probably not, because the vertebrae at the base of the tail are pretty small and loose, and so it's going to have a lot of range of motion. But it's a so very it stick it up. Yeah, and it's but it's a very odd thing to have. Um, Chris at one point suggested. So this was a paper he wrote in something like about 1993, and then he wrote a paper like a year later and went, "I got that wrong. Ignore that." Um, so we're going to bring it up just to make him suffer. Nice. No, no, but it's an interesting little quirk of pteranodon history and something that has hold over in the way that memes and things like this do and that's why i'm emphasizing just how quickly he realized he was wrong and turned it down at a time when we were still not sure about pterosaur wing attachments in general he suggested that this it was almost like a kite-like apparatus and so the wing membrane went from the tip of the wings down across the back of the body and down onto the tail so the main wing membrane was integrated with the tail and the legs were entirely free and he then turned around, as I said, and said, no, actually, don't do that. It's wrong. You still see pteranodon and yeah. often just pteranodon 
with wings drawn that go straight into the tail. So usually they don't give it a long tail. So you've got this horrible amalgam where they've taken this idea and stuck the wings on the tail, even though we think it's wrong, but haven't copied the long tail across properly and ignored the fact that this is a 30-year-old idea which got rejected by its own conceptual creator within months of having come up with it. Um, so can we stop drawing that now, please? Oh, but it seems very much like a, a Batman, you know, glider at that point. Yeah, like I say, it's it? like a little hand yeah. glider over the back. That's what, that, but that, isn't that roughly when Batman came out 93 when batman time? came out oh oh you mean oh so the the michael keaton one was 89 yeah. but he ah, had okay. a, he had a glider in batman returns which was 91 92 yeah you see you see that's where it all oh you're getting into my detailed batman knowledge now. exactly. yeah but, but he, he had a he'd had a like parasail glider for years in the comics but anyway um but no it's just an odd little quirk that you still see um but no i don't think we really know why pteranodon has this weirdly long tail and certainly not these reinforcing rods down the it's very strange for a pterodactyloid and even their near relatives don't have it so nyctosaurs which are extreme even more albatross like super thin wings and tiny little legs and don't even have any fingers in the hand so they just walk around on little stumps that's how much time they spend over the sea they haven't got this tail so it doesn't look like it's any kind of special seagoing tail thing I have a question. Uh-oh. Does the um ter- no no does the pterodon have any elaborate crests? Because if it doesn't, it might explain that the tail is used for sexual selection. Because then it would have like two different. You know, you don't need two things. For sexual selection. So I don't know about pterodon because you keep making that name. Pteranodon. Up, pteranodon. <laughs> Sharp. It's difficult. So Pteranodon is famous for its crest, in fact, okay. and that's something we can talk about extensively. Hooray! Let's talk about crest extensively. Um, so there's two broadly recognised species of Pteranodon. Inevitably, he said immediately not answering the original question and going back to something else, inevitably they have a wonderfully potted history of taxonomy where every half-decent skull was named as yet another new species and even a new genus. And there's 15 or 20 of them knocking around somewhere in the literature. Ignore the vast majority of them. Um, So we have two. We have uh, uh, Pteranodon longiceps. um, What? Long, long, so long, 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 okay. long, long jaw, basically. Okay, I thought you said wongiceps, and I was like, no, long, L O N G, long, long, okay. longiceps, and and Sternbergi, named after the Sternberg family, who were famous fossil hunters and collectors. There's a bunch of Sternbergi and Sternberg, yes, yes, species like that knocking around in various reptile and a few mammal groups as well, I think. And they're primarily distinguished by their head crest. In fact, they're almost exclusively distinguished by their head crest because the rest of the body anatomy is so completely identical coupled with the fact of course that they're all smushed flat and da, 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 that really that's how we identify them so a vast amount of pteranodon specimens these you know thousand plus i mentioned are just listed as pteranodon sp dot pteranodon species as in we know it's a pteranodon who knows we don't know which one it is yeah precisely so uh, longiceps is the one that most people would know in a vertical it's like classic pteranodon head. So it's got a kind of kind of slightly L-shaped, almost boomerang-shaped crest coming off the back of its head and pointing yeah. out back over the body. It's almost like a mirror image of the skull sticking sticking back over, and that's what you see in large males. Uh, we'll get on to females in a Ooh. bit. Pteranodon sternbergi, which is sometimes known by a different genus, Geo sternbergia. I'm not a big fan of that. I'm going to stick to pteranodon for it has i'm trying to think of a good way of describing it so it starts quite narrow at the base of the crest okay and it expands up and back as you might expect at at the front it almost goes vertically from the front of the head and at the back it goes out at about 45 degree angle and then about two-thirds of the way up the front one turns 90 degrees and heads straight back and then has a little bobble at the end to meet the back part of the crest coming up that's not a great description, but it's a really odd shape, and you'll know it when you see it. You know those um, those uh, little wafer fans that you get sometimes in an ice cream sundae? I'm imagining one of those in the back of the head, nearly. No, not really. All right, then. I, I'll, I'll, I'll work it out. I'll work yeah. it. I mean, I think I can see it in my head, but it, as you say, it's really hard to describe. Actually, all my... All my hang on, I'm, I'm trying to think of all... Are you going to look at your hand and try and put it on the back of your head? What yeah, you get, what so, so if, you, if you put your hand up 
and up then where? Right, no, it's just it's in front of you. Tuck your okay. thumb, tuck your thumb in. So you're looking at the back of your hand. You're tucking your thumb in. Thumb in, yeah. yeah. And then your first three fingers fold them at the first knuckle, but keep your little yeah. finger stuck up. A okay. bit like that. So you've got a little bubble at the back. Okay. And then, and then turn it at about 45 degrees. And you've yeah. got basically the beak emerging from from the base of your thumb and, and going towards your other hand. Yes. There you go. Yeah. Roughly like that. So it's it's probably about the same area, but it's shorter and fatter and sticks up more and fatter. sticks back less. So it's not a flat well, no, so that, no, fatter as in broad when looked okay, at side sorry. on. But, yeah, but it is, it's going to be a, a narrow piece of whatever it is. What is it? Yeah. Oh, it's bone. It's a solid chunk of bone off the back of the head. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then females and small males, so we're classically in that problem where you can't tell them apart just have a little one so of apparently both species but again how do we know because we can't tell them apart have just got a little kind of semicircular extension off the back of the head nice. so we have enough skulls in various bits of condition that we're fairly happy we can sort them into those two species and we can distinguish them by the crests and there's no advantage to these crests in terms of flight, I assume. No. So so this is something that's definitely been posited. You know, this is the old mechanical argument that crests are some kind of head rudder. Um, and we actually tested this. So I had a pair of students years ago, um, Carlos Grau and Ross Elgin, who are doing their master's with me. And then Ross later went on to become my PhD student. We talked about him before and some of his work. Um, but we basically tested these models of several pterosaurs in a wind tunnel. We tested the Pteranodon longiceps model with the relatively big male crest. And actually, we were very surprised to found that it made very little difference indeed. We were assuming it would be a negative, a real kind of catastrophic failure, which is what all the others were. We did a poster for them for a conference, but we never ended up publishing them. So we tried Tapajara and Nyctosaurus and a bunch of others. And yeah, the head just goes thunk in the front. As soon as the wind gets up, like the head judders like mad, and then it folds over and snaps the neck. Pteranodon didn't really do that, but it all also didn't help at all mm. so it wasn't providing any mechanism of control or counterbalancing the head effectively and therefore it's still part of the same general argument which is it's a massive chunk of bone which you've grown and lug around all the time if it's not actively giving you an advantage there's still a penalty to growing it and carrying it and again the fact that it really is apparently present in males and not females is another massive um you know tick how can you tell the difference we talked about like um um, medullary bone and that's yeah. the thing is that how you're telling the difference between no so it, it is largely down to the crescent inference on this okay but again it's one of those okay we may not be right here but there are huge numbers of species where the male is much bigger than the female and that's also true of pteranodon and then the males have a really big elaborate feature and the females either have none or only a little one that seems really quite likely here yes it's not impossible that actually Actually, they're giant females um, with reverse sexual dimorphism. It's not impossible that there's multiple different species here and we're mixing them up, but their anatomies are so incredibly similar. And there is some evidence of that female-like crest growing into the male one as they reach sexual maturity in large size. This is really lining up with what you'd expect in the vast majority of cases where you see this kind of thing. It's a big male and a small female. And yeah, the male pteranodons, typically around six meters or so, Though there's a couple of giants that were found fairly recently, which I think are now pushing eight. And that's very big. I mean, that's 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 scary big. Yeah, I mean, really so, scary. I mean, well, I mean, six metres is Six metres is pretty, pretty big and scary. Because six, I can go, oh, that's three of me. I could take yeah. three of me. Couldn't <laughs> take four of me. That's that's too much. So, you know, if we, if we talked about Ashtarchids, you know, the really big ones of them are probably 10 plus metres. Quetzalcoatlus, Arambugiani, Hatsidoptera, it's probably tried Drake on potentially a fair few others as well we just had enough specimens but after that there, for a long time it'd been a pretty big drop off until you got to kind of six six and a half meters for pteranodon and then some of the really big ornithochiroids so the toothed animals that are pretty close relatives with the little crest at the end of the nose like uh tropignathus and then fairly close together we found a really big tropignathus which was something like eight eight and a half and then a pteranodon of that kind of size as well. So, okay, they're still not 10 metres. Remember, that extra two metres makes a big, big difference when it comes to mass as well as wingspan and all the rest of it. But that gap from the biggest Ashtarchids down to the next biggest pterosaurs, which was, you know, getting on for double, 10 and a half, maybe 11 metres down to six, 
has been closed fairly substantially in a couple of different groups and including Pteranodon. Um, so they're, they're not quite as separated out as we thought. And yes, we have some very, very big ones. Uh, the flip side of that actually is we have almost no small pteranodons. Oh, there's no babies. One, maybe two specimens now described who have an estimated wingspan in the realm of like two and a half, three meters. So a substantial animal, and definitely not like a baby baby, but also half That's... the size of uh, you know a mid-sized female or a large female's kind of four meters wingspan and males at six and then these giants at eight yeah but but again it shows you know whatever the juveniles are doing they're probably doing something else because we're just not finding them they're yes. just not out to sea or at least they're going nowhere near where the adults are going i hate to talk about the um uh the prehistoric planet episode that's again the coast one but they did show a species of pterosaur um starting life uh but in it in the forest before then going out to sea yeah is, is that something that that this is sort of you know this is why that sort of thing speculated upon yeah i don't know quite where that came from because we have talked to so ramphorhynchus at least which again we we talked about before uh you know juveniles and adults are found together in the same places and they're both out to sea and they're both feeding on fish that we can tell um and okay you know being properly oceanic is rather different kettle of fish to being kind of coastal and lagoonal but still um it's remarkable that the juveniles aren't turning up i should say you know i kind of suggested earlier and it was supposed to be an analogy that we've got like this giant pteranodon midden that's not the case they're found all over the place they range over a huge area so it's not like there's only one site we just haven't found the juveniles there there are bits of pteranodon coming you know across hundreds and hundreds of miles and we're just not finding juveniles so it seems unlikely well so that's obviously going to be part of it but it seems unlikely that they're just never turning up and as you said you know a two meter animal is still a very sizable thing and it will have been you know will be a couple of years old so it's not like this is just oh well they all got eaten immediately and then it's just a handful that's left yeah, I mean, I mean, two meters. I think a swan is less than that. Maybe a swan is oh, two. No, meters. a swan will be a swan will be two, two and a half, two and a half. But I mean, a goose. It's big. I, I consider those big. Yeah, 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 yeah. So very, very decent size. And again, we've got almost nothing under four. So we've got. You know, even at hatchling, I mean, I'm, I'm hazarding a guess off the top of my head, but I can imagine a big one might be 50, 60 centimetre wingspan. Wow. So to get from, that would be sizable, but to get from that to three metres is still a lot of growing to do and a lot of pterosaurs to be around and us not find basically any. Because again, even though we've got a couple, like two out of a thousand, these are hyper rare. But it does make it does make sense in the sense that, okay, these animals that we're getting in the preservation site is in the middle of the ocean and therefore that is the furthest distance from land and therefore mm. you're not going to get animals incapable of getting there and back going there. And in fact, there is so much death at this point means that maybe it's not a good place to go for adult ones. True, but then, you know, you look at seabirds and, you know, we have few seabirds that get to three metres in wingspan. You know, most gulls, cormorants, orcs, tropic birds, frigate birds, all these, are, are, even the albatross, are well under four metres. So it's not like a flying animal can't cope with I mean, look at swallows go miles. Right, but it's not like they can't yeah. cope with the storms and weather conditions of being that far out to sea. So it's hard to argue that that's really what's doing it. So yeah, I think they're somewhere else. That doesn't necessarily mean they're inland, of course. Uh, but maybe they just get eaten by the adults a lot, so the adults don't want to. But then you think the adults around. are hanging hanging around where the free food is. So yeah, that's true. Um, <sighs> and there's only so much cannibalism you can do because then you eat your own species out, and extinction is going to follow soon after that. That that might be a thing. Yeah. Yes. Okay, I didn't I didn't think that through. But, but yeah, yeah no, where are all, where are they then? Where are the juveniles? Yeah, d don't know is the really short answer. Look for them. <laughs> well, yes, but if they're, if they're not hanging around in areas that form fossils or the fossils are not exposed and not available on the surface for us to find, we have mentioned before, you're going to struggle to do anything meaningful with this. So I don't think yeah. you're trying hard enough, Dave. I want to know where they are. But for someone who's never dug in Kansas, yes, I apologise for not having <laughs> covered numerous juvenile pteranodons for you in my extensive works in the Midwest. 
this. But it it does sound spooky, to be honest, that all of the babies, they all survive to adulthood. That actually doesn't sound spooky. That sounds like a good thing. Maybe they're just really, really amazing at caring for their young and therefore every single baby survived. Every single one. And didn't get any diseases or anything. Yes, I wouldn't be betting on that. <laughs> I'm going to go back to that uh, to the tale because we, I kind of asked a question we got distracted by head crests and did went we? the other way. Yes, we did. Because I was asking the tale then. Could it be a signal? Yeah, because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't make sense to have this elaborate tale and have a head crest at the same time because why would you need two ways of being beautiful? So one option, which I don't think anyone seriously explored, is that it had a bigger uropotagium. It had a bigger leg potagium than most other pterodactyloids, and it really did do something with the tail. No one's looked at the mechanics of that. I'm not. I just need to interrupt you very quickly and say that the uropotagium is the membrane at the back. Yeah. Because yeah, I know, I know. But you, you use these big words, and some of us who still say. Yeah, but I think we said it in like four episodes by now, back to back. So hopefully I know, we can, like, but remember. remember, we're this far into the episode, and I still say pterodon. So. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> as you have done throughout the recording of previous episodes as well. I know, it's because Tyrannodon doesn't make sense in my head. <laughs> anyway, um, so it's it's at least possible. I don't think anyone's ex- written about this in the literature. No one's definitely explored it mechanically, as in looked at what effects they actually have, but it's at least possible that it's got some odd leg membrane articulations going on with the tail. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is that it really is a, a signaling structure. I've argued that that's largely what's going on with Ranforincus and potentially a bunch of other non-pterodactyloids as well. And you say, why would you need two? Well, that's really often the case. I mean, look at peacocks. You know, they have the most elaborate, overdone train going, and yet they've still got that pathetic little crest of feathers on the top of the head, which is, you know, compared to everything else, is absolutely pointless. You know, there's lots of things that integrate multiple signals. You know, birds with head crests and bright wings and bright tails. You know, this, this is really pretty normal. Could it also be that maybe it's actual signalling? Could they have been flock animals and they could use their tails to signal to each other as a way of going, we've got to go this way because there are fishes, we've got to go that way, because at sea it's hard for like sound to be over a distance or anything like that? Well, I don't think it is because, again, you know, seabirds get away with making lots of raucous noises and don't have any kind of elaborate signals. Remember, sound carries in all directions. And if you're going to have a big signal like that, you've already got the head. I mean, just, just make the head a bright colour, regardless of the crest. Could it be a way of catching fish so you could dangle your tail very low over the water? No. And, oh. <laughs> let's, let's just stop that right now. Oh. Uh, but in terms of living, them living in flocks, I mean, everyone's always rather assumed that they did, simply because they're so common. But again, it's not like we regularly find dozens of them together. And you wouldn't expect that on the open ocean, even if by some, you know, like a typhoon or something or a storm, you know, takes out 500 at once, the waves are still going to spread them all out and then they're going to break up and then things are going to eat them. Um, so we, I, I can't even think off the top of my head of any example where we've got like two or three skeletons together or even bits of skeletons. So, you know, like we've got three left legs. Well, OK, there must be at least three animals here. I don't think even that's the case, but everyone's kind of assumed that, again, like modern seabirds, they're not necessarily hanging around in a flock from a social point of view. And we talked about sociality, but more that there's no real competition for fish. Uh, and so everyone is going to benefit from hanging around each other generally because you're better at finding fish. And if a predator does turn up, it's less likely to be you that gets grabbed. Yeah. And, you know, certainly the kind of fish that they're going after are probably in mass aggregations. You've, you've got to find them and target them and being off on your own, you, you may not find anything to eat. So they're more like commuters than a football team. Yeah, but, but that's not a bad one. But again, we you know we have stuff like this. So uh, Cayman in um, South America have been observed doing this. We talked about that with them lining up across the river. Yeah, we did. Yeah, so you, you do a bit better from that, but you're not cooperating in quite the way that we might say things like, you know, lions or hyenas are cooperating. You're basically being an individual that's using everybody else, but in so doing, everybody benefits. Yeah, and so that that's why it's worth doing. They're capitalist caimans. <laughs> yeah. <In that> <laughs> um, so yeah, that that that's probably what's 
going on with them. Uh, but yeah, yeah quite, quite what that tale does, don't know. And it would be really interesting to look at it because again it, it's i don't I, I don't want to be overly functional and go it's there for a reason because of course uh, there's lots of odd quirks of anatomy and biology which are there for no other reason but when all its ancestors have much shorter tails and its near relatives have much shorter tails and that you know and we think that weight is a massive controlling factor on these animals it then becomes hard to argue that it's just randomly gained this extra rod of bone at the at the back end for no apparent reason what it what it is you see dave and I know you're going to get angry, is that the mummy uh, Pteranodon goes low over the water, dips her tail in the water, and all the fishies come up and chase the tail, and all of her offspring behind go and they get all the food, and that's the thing, and then she dies, but they all live with all the fish, and they're happy. So that is what is happening. In Izzy's mind, he looks so angry. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so moving on to actual science oh. rather than rather than madness. Um, oh. <laughs> but, so one one thing that we do get from this, which I think is worth talking about, from the fact that we have so many, is of course once you've got a sample size that big, even if lots of them are broken or, or very very incomplete, is rare things start turning up. So pathologies in pterosaurs are not very common. We don't find too many. There's quite a few in pteranodon. So various bits of healed broken bones and infections and little things like this, which is rather nice. Uh, Stomach contents. We do have multiple pteranodon with fish inside them. No surprises there. No, No surprises there, but it's still nice to get confirmation of that. Be really weird if it's like apples. Uh, yes. Well, the fact that the fact that they preserved there aren't as any well. Apples. Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, we don't have other things that they're probably eating. So you know, stuff like squid really not going to preserve well at all. Sharks. There's very little bone in sharks. Um, I'm sure they're eating stuff like this. I'm sure they're grabbing random other things if they can. You know, you've got Hesperornithines and other birds around and. Hesperolithines. Yes. That's a good name. Yes, uh, the grebe-like swimming marine birds. Okay, so they're, they're basically an early bird that looks like a grebe that does fulfills the function of a grebe. Cool. But flightless and marine. Completely flightless. Yeah, they're one, they're one of the earliest flightless birds. I'm sure we talked about this, but birds ditching... No. We didn't mention this with penguins because, you know. But b- birds ditch flight really, really fast in multiple different... They go to all this effort, inverted commas, to evolve flight and they probably go, ah, nah, that's not bother. Well, it's quite, it looks it looks like hard work, to be fair. It is. I'm sure Pteranodon are eating them if they're yeah. available, but we haven't found it. The flip side is, of course, we've then got a whole bunch of Pteranodon that have been eaten by other things. Ooh. So um, I think there's some Pteranodon bones inside a Mosasaur. Not Makes a big sense. surprise. Um, there's various pteranodon skeletons with uh, tooth marks from sharks and other things. And then there's a paper I wrote with um, Mark Whitten and Mike, Mike B four or five years ago now, which, again, was in the literature and mentioned, I think, in at least three, if not four different papers we found, but no one had ever illustrated or written anything about it or said any details. There's an incomplete pteranodon neck, so four or five vertebrae in a chain, but all touching each other, and that's how they were found, and a shark tooth wedged into one of them. <laughs> so, yeah, we were able to work out what shark it was, I think it was Squalicorax, it worked out to be, and how big it was, and roughly what its gape was, and work out how big the pteranodon was from its neck, and go, yeah, actually, that's a decent-sized pteranodon, but a very big shark <laughs> just, just nailed it. Of course, we don't know if it was already dead, or if it was caught on the surface, or at the surface, or just below the surface, or flying or over actually the surface. jumping out the water, Dave. This is what everybody wants to... This is what the artists do. So that's what the press report so Mark, wonderful paleo artist, wanted to do something interesting, did this wonderful illustration of uh, the shark breaching. So this is something that you really see with stuff like great whites when they're hitting small things like sea lions. They don't just bite them. They like drive the entire shark out of the water with its momentum and just, you know, you get this entire great white clear of the water, this bits of seal kind of disintegrating around it um, before it hits. So Mark drew that because if a pteranodon is diving or is floating on the surface or cruising just at it, that's what you'd expect to happen. That's how big 
mackerel sharks like this hunt. And then we put that out and in the press release made it incredibly clear what this was. And almost every single bit of press said sharks jumped to catch pterosaurs. Yeah, that's that's exactly what happened though, Dave, because they saw the picture. And that's what they wanted to see because it is really cool. And also they got sucked up into a tornado and got on a plane. <laughs> so... <laughs> Was there, was there sharks on a plane? I, think it's I, think, on I don't a plane. know. There's snakes on a plane, but I think in Sharknado, they, there's a shark that comes through a plane. In the... Oh, okay. There's, there's, I think it's Mega Shark versus Giant Octopus, a sci fi channel level asylum film of a classic of the oeuvre, and one I cannot recommend enough. It has, it has, I will say, I'm distracting myself from my own distraction story. It has the best sciencing montage scene ever, which literally has three people in lab coats with coloured liquids in test tubes and just slowly pour them from one to the other several times and that's their making of a formula to do something that's that's good i like that i like it when they do coding and they all gather around the computer screen and then like type 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 and then enter and then they wait and they look surprised yes and it's it um but anyway mega shark versus giant octopus the i think like the opening scene and obviously mega shark is really quite bit you know like 50 meter long shark and it jumps out of the water and cuts a 747 in half amazing <laughs> because of course it does so yeah that that's what they're doing so ladies and gentlemen that's exactly how um pteranodon were hunted by sharks is the equivalent of a 50 meter shark going after a 747 which is 33,000 I'm cruising Feet. yeah yeah anyway it might so, have been coming into land actually that makes more yeah, sense you're trying to pick holes in a perfectly plausible exactly Ceranodon then uh, why why don't they have any teeth well they do have a beak um, and we can see the kind of texture mapping on that which probably links to where it attaches though really coolly there was one described ooh 2016 something like that uh, this one that turned up in a collection I can't I'm going to say probably Kansas but I can't remember exactly where it's always Kansas and it's got these weird like stripes on the bone going ooh. down the beak and I I'm struggling to remember what they concluded that this was. It's reminding me of Spitfires on the D-Day landing because they were all black and white striped. Mm. Um, but I think there's at least the possibility that it was, you know, linked to surface structure of the beak in some way, shape or form. I mean, it's very, if you found it on the crest, you'd go, oh, wow, they've got weird crest structure and that's going to be linked to colour and display and stuff. And it's down the beak. So very, very odd indeed. I mean, maybe it offsets the crest. So you've got to, you know, you've got beak one colour to really exaggerate the crest. Maybe. Yeah, but you really wouldn't expect that to change, like, the bone grain. No, that's weird. Yeah, it's very, very weird. So that's the first thing. The second thing to say is about their heads and jaws generally. So their jaws are really deep. Um, I think people think they have this, like, super long pointy head. Well, they do have to get a super long pointy head. Um, but the back of the lower jaw is actually surprisingly robust. It's about as deep as the head is tall, and of course, less right. depressed. It's a very, very solid back of the jaw. And then the lower jaw is rather shorter than the upper jaw. So they it's don't... They're a bit, they're the, a bit the, posh. The tips don't meet. Yeah, you've got a really quite considerable extent of upper jaw longer than lower jaw. I suspect once the keratin's all on there, it lines up rather closer. But there's still probably going to be a gap between the two, uh, which, again, you see in some birds. But it's it's often not how these animals are drawn, where people will show, you know, just the two jaws tapering to a point at the tip. And it's like, that's not what they have. You can see it. So they both have a strong jaw and a weak jaw because they've got their jaw set back a little yes. bit. And they're, yes. they're ho, ho, ho. Yes. Um, you know, you, again, again, t- t- it works well on radio with you. I know. Well, we're not. We're not on the radio. Out. Dave. I know, but I could, I could, I could provide art of just do pteranodon. You know how I do a little bit of the art sometimes, and I put the actual yes. animal we're talking about on it. I could just have a picture of me with my um with my uh, jaw back going. Oh, I've got pteranodon. <laughs> I'll, I'll even do that thing with the back of my head <laughs> like that. There you go. I'm making him laugh, if not you. <laughs> so uh, we've seen other pteranodon. Um, 
ter- pterosaurs with uh, lots of teeth to help catch fish. Why wouldn't they? I mean, I know modern seabirds don't have, you know, have a similar. I thing. think it's that kind of either or thing in that you either want lots of teeth to properly make sure that you've grabbed them and grip them and hold on to them, or you want no teeth to ditch that weight and have kind of because um, remember you can strengthen the jaw quite effectively with keratin, and you know, and then for have uh, something that slices through the water rather better whereas something in between is going to be a bit rubbish so you either see things like you know gharials and dolphins that have loads and loads and loads of teeth or you ditch them um, and then just have a beak though remember you can make beaks incredibly sharp and even serrated i don't know if we talked about penguins well we have talked about penguins and we talked about this aspect of penguins before and my distaste nip. for hunt bolt penguins yeah having been bitten by them when i worked at bristol <laughs> zoo the margin of their beak is unbelievably sharp and serrated and they just slice through you so sharp like a paper cut you haven't even noticed it's happened and then you bleed ridiculously because of the serrations and how deep the bites are there are loads and loads of you know magansas for modern ducks uh, geese have something like it for a very different reason, but again, like lots of little Gosh. ridges. Yeah, but lots of little ridges and stuff. You've got the um, pseudo toothed birds, which are extinct, but post Cretaceous, they weren't around in the Mesozoic. And they look like they've got teeth in the jaw, but they haven't because the birds, they've got rid of their teeth. What they actually have is just like sharp little pointy ridges in the margin of the jaw which are then coated in keratin to give them a tooth-like structure of from made from pure bone, hence their names. Is that why, because um, I know there's that, um, we don't need to mention his name, except there's a guy who's um, obsessed with trying to uh, genetically alter chickens to look like dinosaurs and that sort of thing. And they give chickens, quote unquote, teeth. It, are those real teeth or are they just those things in the beak? I think in, in the case of the dino chicken stuff, it, they are teeth in the sense okay. that there are still genes for that knocking around and they're basically reactivating them. Okay. The, the, the pseudo tooth birds are, are convergent. Well, not they're not quite convergently, but they're, they're, they're producing almost like a mimic of their previous condition. But it's a further evolution of their structure. Um, but yeah, long and short of this is we don't have i don't think any keratinous beaks for pteranodon and that would be really nice but i would not be at all surprised if we did to find that it's really quite serrated or has got some kind of hook structure or something like that to it to give them a remarkable amount of grip so don't think that just because the bone that we have is very very smooth and sharp that that's necessarily you know it's got like four razor edges and that's how it's hunting because i really doubt it was so you say that makes it very hard to grip things and that's not what you get in seabirds and and beaks of things like that cool what else what else do we know about them that i need to know is it we only get them in sort of like either inside stuff or in ocean deposits so pteranodon ter- itself yes so the pteranodon is inevitably part of a bigger group called uh, pteranodon tids and then the bigger again pteranodon toids um, which usually includes nyctosaurs. So I think we've talked about nyctosaurs. What is a nyc- nyctosaurs? So, nyctosaurs are the night reptiles. Um, so again, for prehistoric planet watchers, though, we're not just going to refer to that all the time. So Barbarodactylus with the big antler on its head. Oh yeah, the ridiculous antler on its head. Is, is a nyctosaur. And yeah, no, so as I mentioned a few minutes ago, no fingers and even really exaggerated wings. Um, and so those are kind of like the, the like the hyper albatross like shaped pterosaurs most people think that nyctosaurs and pteranodontids go together and are very close relatives for good reasons they look very similar to each other um nyctosaurus itself not known from too many specimens but from the same fossil bed so we found them in and around pteranodon stuff so pteranodon isn't the only pterosaur out there nyctosaurus is there's musquizopteryx from mexico there's You're this just r- making them up now Mus- musquizopteryx musquizopteryx m-u-s-q-u-i-z i think it's the name of the town or the area where it was found um there's a random nyctosaur humerus from south america at the very end cretaceous like maastrichtian so we know they got to the very end feminized archids and not a lot else it's a couple have turned up in north africa um but yeah they're all 
all the nyctosaurs are either coastal or properly marine sediments. Uh, but yeah, so the, they look very, at the base level, they look very similar to pteranodon, just smaller, usually only a couple of meters in wingspan. So actually there's a reason to suggest that small things do preserve yeah. where you find pteranodon. We can at least find nyctosaurs, nyctosaurus, but we don't find baby pteranodon. So they're around and they don't really get into any terrestrial systems, but they really look like pteranodon, just with no fingers and a weirder head crest. And we don't know, we don't have any nest sites or anything where... No, you just wouldn't. That. They're almost certainly nesting on rocks and cliffs and it's like, you're just never going to find that. Yeah. But the Chris Bennett actually, and I'm not sure there's anyone else, I'm struggling to think off the top of my head, thinks that actually they're quite separated and that they convergently acquired the same set of characteristics oh. because if you're trying to be an albatross, there's only really one good shape to be and that's albatross shaped and therefore you would get two different animals lumping on the same general body plan. Like the reason why everybody looks like a human in a costume in Star Trek is because the universe says that, you know, all all intelligent life must uh, end up being humanoid shaped apparently no they fix they <laughs> fix that there's a there's a next generation episode where they oh, yeah. tr- they track down some alien planet and when humans romulans klingons and i think the ferengi come together they unlock a thing and it's a recording from a species that says oh we've seeded the galaxy with dna that uh... one day will end up produce something your shape and that's why they're all the same shape and that's why they can all have babies with each other that makes total sense it's madness but at least there is an in-universe explanation for why everyone just looks human with some odd forehead wrinkles except that's uh, not how dna works you can't retrofit it like that no, hence no, sh- why sh- those sh- beaks sh- sh- no they've got the answer <laughs> No, 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 that's why those beaks, they don't really go, oh, we'll just go to our old bit of DNA and slowly grow teeth. You go, no, we're going to readapt our other thing. I mean, thing, if, if, you you, if you've seen how they generally treat DNA in Star Trek, this, is, this is one of the least worst uses of it as a plot device. Um, but anyway... Actually, the, the last thing is probably worth talking about is the taxonomy, because okay. aside from the horrible mess of a dozen plus random species of pteranodon, which should never have been named in the first place, recently um, we've got Dawn Draco turning up. So Alex Kellner, a famous Brazilian pterosaur researcher, revised pteranodon a bit. And one thing is re-separated pteranodon sternbergi into geosternbergia, I mean, at this point, it's much of a muchness because if you still consider it separate, whether you consider it a separate species in Pteranodon or a separate genus that's the closest relative of Pteranodon, it's basically the same thing and therefore largely irrelevant. Personally, I don't think the differences are enough to really warrant a genus separation, but that's a, that's a by the by. But Dawn Draco was the other one that he split off. And Dawn Draco is based on a specimen, I think that's held in, in a Canadian connection, in a co- collection. I can't remember which one now got a feeling it's like university of um edmonton or somewhere slightly odd like this it's a partial skeleton though not a bad one at all more than you get for your average pteranodon and an incomplete skull but we've got the most of the back of the head though the crest is missing and then the front like two-thirds of the snout and the front two-thirds of the snout carry on more or less parallel as in the top of the nose and the bottom of the jawline for really quite a long way, whereas pteranodon, you would normally think just... It's sloped down. Yeah, it tapers down. Uh, Alex argued that this is actually really quite distinctive and with a couple of other features was worthy of generic separation. The response paper was written to that fairly quickly going, no, if you look at the pool of data and actually if you measure it, yeah, it looks weird compared to what you think. But if you, if you measure loads of them, you'll see that actually... It falls in the distribution. It's not far out from the ones which are pretty similar and they're not too far from the ones which look more normal and therefore it's more of a smear. But I have to say, it's one of those ones where even when the stats go, no, no, look, it's really not that far out. Look at it go, it is weird though. It really <laughs> is weird though. I'm personally a bit on the fence And the flip side of that, of course, is that, you know, most of these things don't have heads and we effectively named them. They did. I'm just going to underline that they did have heads, but they don't because they didn't preserve. (laughs) Pteranodon are not fundamentally headless. Um, But, you know, the vast majority of the specimens that we've got don't have heads. And as I say, we just refer to them as pteranodon spur because we don't know what they are. 
given the sheer number of them and given the diversity of modern seabirds, and particularly in the light of the fact that we don't have all these juveniles, we talked about multiple niche filling and all the rest of it, it does seem a bit unlikely that you've really got two pteranodon species and Nyctosaurus, and that's it, covering quite a few million years and an ocean. You really would think there'd be a few more of them out there. And okay, many of those things are probably going to be much more coastal. We don't have those coastal deposits. We're not finding them. Overall, on balance, I look at that and go, surely there are more species out there. You know, when, when we have really good deposits that preserve pterosaurs well, we've, you know, we've talked about this before, a dozen, 15 species in Germany, two or three different sites in China, each of which have over a dozen, you know, half a dozen, seven, eight coming out of two different sites in Brazil. And these have produced far fewer specimens than we're getting from Pteranodon in far smaller areas. So, yeah, whether or not Dawn Draco is valid is one thing, but I would be gobsmacked if 100 years from now we're still talking about just these two Pteranodons and Nyctosaurus that are out there in these Kansas and related beds. I am sure there are plenty of other pterosaur species and we just haven't found them or recognised them yet. And the sheer absence of juveniles points to there being other locations that are going to be full of pterosaurs. We just haven't got to them. So I'm sure there's more. We're, we're just finding the equivalent of the wandering albatross and we're not we're not on the classic British coastline where there's... Puffins. <laughs> well, well, and, and razorbills and seven or eight different gulls and, 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 and all of that other stuff. So yeah, there's going to be tons of pterosaurs out there. We just haven't got them yet. And so Dawn Draco could easily be one of them. Exactly. Well, you should go find them, Dave. Go find them. Go. Come on. Come on. Go yeah, now. I'll go do now it Thursday. Find them. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, unfortunately, this episode has come out uh, before Dave's new naming all of the different... <laughs> More uh, naming a dozen new <laughs> Kansas chalk pteranodontids. Exactly. Just go, well, that was a bit different to that one. That There must be different species. There you go. It's easy, isn't it? I don't know why he complains. Cool. Um, well, that was Pteranodon and not... What not Pterodon. Yeah, not you, can't pterodon. Get, you can't even get it wrong now. God, this is... <laughs> I'm very, very... I'm very, I've got a very plastic brain, Dave. As in, as in flexible or made of? No, as in, as in, as in mushy. <laughs> I've got, a, I've got a a, child, a cheap child's toy left out in the sun for a brain. <laughs> And as a result, it will retain any impression that you leave in it, but only for a short amount of time. <laughs> it kind of pops. Exactly. And it sort of pops back and everything's fine. So um, that was Pteranodon. Um, if you have any questions about Pteranodon, please email terriblelizardspod at gmail.com. We do do a questions episode at the end of every series. Um, obviously, we give preference to our wonderful patrons. You can find those at patreon.co.u. No, that's not right. Patreon.com forward slash terriblelizards. I know things. Dave is all he's looking at me the same way that you know he looks at me when I say pterodon um <laughs> actually, actually I'm mostly thinking about lunch because it's nearly lunch oh yeah no it's nearly <laughs> lunch time we should go do that what are you having I'm going to go with squid and some deep uh sea uh type of shark actually uh, I'm going to fly over the ocean with my tail in the water and my baby's following me because right. that is not what happened che- cheese and pickle sandwich in a soft brown roll that's what they used to eat guys <laughs> <laughs> all right then until next week um, i mean i i wish i had my recorder so i could do a proper seagull noise because do you ever do that with the top of a recording oh, no like I've, got, I've got a duck caller <laughs> that's not that i don't but they might um, i'll get me duck <laughs> okay you get your duck and now dave picks up his duck caller and comes back it's Jeez. pretty good to a little tube of wood with a with a bin oh that's very good <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's basically what you sound like when you're explaining complex science to me, so that's fine. <laughs> Is his brain. <laughs> oh, I didn't know. That's amazing. Well done. All right, then. Um, after three, then, we will say goodbye in the form of a seabird. <laughs>
<laughs> unsubscribe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for downloading this episode of Terrible Lizards. To support us, please become a patron on patreon.com forward slash terrible lizards. If you can't do that, don't worry. Just leave us an amazing review on your podcast app. Also, you can check us out on Twitter. I am I-S-Z-I underscore L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E and Dave is D-A-V-E underscore H-O-N-E. You can also check out our books. Dave's got a load of dinosaur ones. I've got a load of children ones i also do other podcasts as well go to isdi.com if you have dinosaur questions you're going to want to email terrible lizards pod at gmail.com that way we can answer them in the questions episode i think that's all i have time to tell you but thank you if you support the show already you are amazing we will see you next time <laughs>